Having a six ounce puck, flying around speeds near 90 miles an hour, with some of the most violent players on earth playing with literal blades underneath their feet, is just a recipe for a disaster. But have you ever wondered how much of a disaster is it? Well, Clint Millarchuk has had an open artery on the ice. Steve Moore has had multiple broken vertebrae and Richard Zednick lost five pints of blood after his neck was slashed. Without further ado, these are the worst injuries from all 32 NHL teams. Pittsburgh Penguins, Sidney Crosby. This marked the beginning of Sid the Kid's struggles and while many remember the first of these checks, there are actually two contributing factors to Crosby's first NHL concussion. The first came on January 1st, 2011, the winter classic between the Pens and the Washington Capitals. On the play, the puck goes past Crosby and David Steckel, then skates into Crosby on purpose, making direct contact with his head. Crosby fell to the ice, but he got up and left under his own power. Steckel was not suspended for this play, which in my opinion was a pretty obvious, glaring no-no. But then Crosby did not miss a game, despite probably having a concussion. They just didn't have the same tools as we have now to really tell. And just four nights later, he played against the Tampa Bay Lightning. And in this game, Crosby was again hit from behind by Victor Hedman, and he again struggled off the ice. And this was the last time Crosby played in the 2010-11 season, finishing with an incredible 66 points in just 41 games played, which is really good considering all of that he just went through. But this concussion not only kept Crosby out for the remainder of the season, but it also delayed his start to the following season. Next up, the Vegas Golden Knights featuring Brett Howden. In a game against the Nashville Predators, Brett Howden faced a frightening injury. During the first period of the Vegas' 6-1 win, Howden crashed face first into the boards in the neutral zone after colliding with Predators' Philip Forsberg. Howden had to be stretched off the ice, but it was seen that he was also lifting his arm, giving acknowledgement to the fans and his teammates with a nice old thumbs up. The game was stopped for 9 minutes and later, the Golden Knights came out to announce that Howden was in stable condition and he went to the hospital for further examination. Thankfully though, a day later, the Vegas Golden Knights did come out with positive news. They stated that Howden avoided any bone breakage and his injury was not career threatening. Thankfully, Vegas is a new team and we haven't really seen any really bad injuries thus far. Arizona Coyotes, Clayton Keller. One of Arizona's Coyote stars, Clayton Keller faced a significant setback when he was taken off the ice again in a stretcher against the San Jose Sharks. He collided into the boards, crashing his legs first, prompting a 10 minute delay in the game. Sounds just like me in practice when I was 12, and man, I broke my tibia and fibula and a spiral fracture. It was crazy. Feel bad for this man. Anyways, he remains down on the ice for about five minutes before being wheeled off, reassuring everyone with a thumbs up. Fortunately, Keller made a full recovery in time for the following season, where he achieved career-high numbers, 37 goals and 49 assists, totaling 86 points in the 2022-23 season. This incident, though daunting, did not impede Keller's promising career trajectory. From the Buffalo Sabres, we have Clint Millarchuk. Now, during a game against the St. Louis Blues on March 22, 1989, Buffalo Sabres Clint Millarchuk faced a horrifying incident. Steve Tuttle of the Blues crashed hard into the net, colliding with Millarchuk and causing Tuttle's skate blade to sever Millarchuk's carotid artery. The sight of blood gushing from Millarchuk's neck onto the ice left spectators physically sickened. The excessive bleeding led to 11 fans fainting, two having heart attacks, and three players vomiting onto the ice. Millarchuk believed he was going to die, and he expressed his urgent desire to leave the ice, obviously, especially with his mother watching the game on TV. Thankfully, quick action by the Sabres athletic trainer, a former USA Army combat medic who served in Vietnam, proved very crucial to this incident. He gripped Millarchuk's neck, hinging off the blood vessels until the doctors arrived to stabilize the wound. And according to the doctors, this is the only reason why Millarchuk was able to stay alive, let alone play hockey again. Next up is the second generation of Howes. The Carolina Hurricanes Mark Howe. 
In an incident dating back to 1982, before the Hurricanes era, Mark Howe, playing for the Hartford Whalers, faced a horrifying injury. Sliding into the pointed metal center of the net, Howe suffered a 5-inch gash in his upper thigh essentially impaled by the material piece of the goal. This injury posed as a severe threat to his career and NHL actually had to alter their net design, eliminating the center portion that extended toward the goal line. Despite the Whalers trading him to the Philadelphia Flyers, Howe went on to become a Norris Trophy winning defenseman. Chicago Blackhawks, Connor Murphy. In a harrowing incident from March 2022, Connor Murphy was taken off the ice on a stretcher. Parker Kelly of the Ottawa Senators delivered a hit from behind, sending Murphy head first into the board. The collision occurred as both players chased down the puck in the Blackhawks zone, and Kelly, seemingly committed to the hits, collided with Murphy, who turned his body at the last moment, making himself more vulnerable. The impact caused Murphy to go face first into the boards, resulting in a concussion. Kelly only received a five minute boarding penalty and a game misconduct, and he didn't face any suspension after this. Murphy didn't return to the lineup until the following season. Colorado Avalanche, Steve Moore. On March 8th of 04, after failing to engage in a Todd Bartuzzi fight, Todd Bartuzzi punched the Avalanche forward from behind in the head. Bartuzzi stayed on Moore, driving his face into the ice as they both fell. This is one of hockey's most iconic hits, and it's something we never want to see again. The two other players quickly piled on, leaving Moore motionless on the ice. He had to be removed from the ice with a stretcher and had suffered three broken bones in his neck, a concussion and facial laceration. Steve Moore never played a game in the NHL again, but Bartuzzi did just a season later at the end of the 0405 lockout. Next up, the Columbus Blue Jackets, we have Nick Foligno. In October 2014, left winger Nick Foligno suffered a serious injury after being hit by Jeff Carter and colliding in the elbow of a linesman. Despite the linesman's attempt to avoid the collision, Foligno was taken off the ice on a stretcher, with just over 11 minutes left in the third period. Fortunately, an MRI revealed that there was no structural damage to his spinal cord. Foligno, recalling the incident, mentions it was the first time he was genuinely scared on the ice. Once he started feeling his limbs again on the stretcher, he expressed his eagerness to get back out there, embodying the classic hockey player resilience. Just like OB when he took that slap shot right to the face on the bench. Have you heard of Mike Medano from the Dallas Stars? Well, in December of 1997, Oilers defenseman Brian Marshman, of course, was suspended three games by the NHL for a hit that sidelined Dallas Stars player Mike Badano for over a month, causing him to miss 10 games. Marshman, known for his dirty play, was fined a league maximum of $11,000, which is basically pocket money, and assessed a match penalty. At the time of the hit, Madano was the NHL's leading scorer. The result was a torn knee ligament affecting Madano's performance in the playoffs and in a subsequent encounter in the same season, Marchman continued his reckless play, elbowing yet another Stars player, resulting in injury and surgery. Come on guys, do you think that the NHL should kind of increase the fine, the maximum fine of $11,000? Let us know in the comments below. Next up from the Detroit Red Wings, Yuri Fisher. Why not a typical hockey player injury? The Red Wings defenseman Yuri Fisher experienced a life-threatening incident during the NHL game. On November 21st of 05, Fisher went into cardiac arrest during a game against the Nashville Predators. Probably one of the scariest moments we've ever seen. Thankfully, he was rushed to the hospital and survived, but the heart abnormalities he faced ultimately ended his hockey career. Yuri Fisher transitioned into a role within the Red Wings organization at least, contributing to scouting and player development. So he's still a part of the game, even though this threatening incident happened. Oh, and also the game was canceled. Now from the Edmonton Oilers, we have Taylor Hall. In the 2011-2012 season, Edmonton Oilers winger Taylor Hall faced a unique and unfortunate incident. I kid you not that during pre-game warmups, Taylor Hall 
who wasn't wearing a helmet or visor, lost his balance after stepping on a puck and slid into teammate Corey Potter. In the process, Potter's skate came down on Hall's exposed face, resulting in a serious cut. This is not something to laugh at, despite the fact that he was just playing recklessly in the goddamn warm-up. Fortunately, a plastic surgeon, of course, is now present at the rink in Columbus, and he saves Hall from a hospital trip. Despite attempting to get back in the lineup that night, Hall needed 30 stitches to close the skate cut. If you're enjoying today's video, leave a like and subscribe to our channel. Florida Panthers Richard Zegnick On February 10th of 2008, Florida Panthers forward Richard Zednick faced a terrifying incident during a game against the Buffalo Sabres. Zednick's throat was inadvertently slit by the skate blade of falling teammate Ole Jokinen. Despite losing five pints of blood, five pints! Imagine how much beer that is in blood, holy cow. Anyways, emergency surgery performed by the doctors thankfully saved Zednick's life. Released from the hospital just six days later, Zednick met the press to share his harrowing story. He did miss the remainder of that season, but he made a triumphant return the following year, earning a Masterton nomination. Los Angeles Kings, Charlie Simmer On March 2nd of 1981, Charlie Simmer of the LA Kings suffered a painful injury in a game against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Simmer was checked into the boards, resulting in a broken leg on impact. The injury forced Simmer to miss the remainder of the season and the playoff. During this setback, Simmer finished the career with an impressive 56 goals and 105 points in just 65 games played, making it a pretty good year. Now of the Vancouver Canucks, of course, is no other Donald Brashear. On February 21st of 2000, the Vancouver Canucks tough guy, Donald Brashear, suffered a severe injury in a game against the Boston Bruins. And of course, Bruins enforcer Marty McSorley hit Brashear in the head with his stick with just three seconds remaining in the game. The announcer said it was an accident. Upon simple glance, you can kind of assume it wasn't. Brashear's head hit the ice, resulting in a serious concussion, which back then they didn't even know about. So it's amazing that they could, could even fathom the fact that it was probably not ideal for him to play again, uh, at least that game. McSorley was suspended for the rest of the 99-2000 season, and he never played another NHL game. He was later found guilty of criminal assault and sentenced to 18-month probation for his attack on Brashear, which is honestly well-deserved. Now, we have Minnesota Wild's Curtis Foster. Curtis Foster of the Minnesota Wild endured a horrific injury on March 20th of 2008 during a game against the San Jose Sharks. Foster raced to touch off on an icing, called behind his own net when he collided with Tori Mitchell of the Sharks, and the collision sent Foster crashing violently into the boards, breaking his femur. Removed from the ice on a stretcher, Foster required surgery to repair the broken bone, which of course ended his 07-08 season and playoffs. Now from the Toronto Maple Leafs, we have Brian Baird. On March 11th of 2000, Toronto Maple Leafs defenseman Brian Berard faced a tragic incident. During a game against the Ottawa Senators, Berard was accidentally clipped in the eye by the stick of Ottawa Senator Marion Hossa. The impact caused a retinal tear and later detached retina, disrupting Berard's hockey career. He underwent seven different eye surgeries, forcing him to miss the rest of the 99-2000 season and the entire following year due to limited vision. In the 01-02 season, Berard made a courageous return to action with the New York Rangers and fortunately played six more seasons in the NHL, which is pretty impossible considering his frickin' retina was dislocated. Now from the Nashville Predators, we have Matt Duchesne. Teammate Dante Fabros shot hit Duchesne in the head, severing his fingertip inside the glove requiring surgery. Duchesne also noted that it didn't hurt as bad as other injuries he's had. It just felt weird. Despite sustaining two fractures in his finger and being unable to reattach the fingertip, Duchesne was fortunate that no tendons were affected, so he was able to return shortly. Now from the New Jersey Dells, we have Micro Molar. It was a downright scary and not, if not terrifying moment when the New Jersey Devils defenseman Michael Muller went head first into the boards during the third period of a game against the Calgary Flames. Muller lost his footing on a 2-on-1 play going head first into the boards. 
Stretched off the ice, Mola gave a thumbs up when he was wheeled off, indicating positive signs. While he had a feeling of all extremities, Muller was taken to the hospital for more testing and fortunately he avoided major injuries and was only labeled with a shoulder injury when it was all said and done. Winnipeg Jets, Blake Wheeler. In a testament to sacrifices players make for the Stanley Cup, Winnipeg Jets' Blake Wheeler demonstrated extraordinary commitment in the final game of the series against the Edmonton Oilers. During the third period, Wheeler courageously blocked a shot in a rather sensitive area, if you know what I mean. Despite the discomfort, the Jets emerged victorious with a 4-3 triple overtime win, securing a sweep of the Oilers in four games. After taking the shot to the groin, Wheeler had to skate off the ice and into the locker room to fix his goddamn can. However, he remarkably returned for overtime, reflecting on the play after the game. Wheeler humorously stated that I've got three beautiful kids and we're not having any more, so what the hell. I appreciate him just for that statement, holy cow. Now, from the New York Islanders, we have Rick DiPietro. In the beginning of the end for Rick DiPietro, came what should have been one of his proudest moments, his first and only All-Star game. During the skills competition, he injured his hip while stretching for a Marion Gaborik shot. Ironically, the Islanders could have drafted Gaborik in the 2000 draft if they had held on to Roboter Luongo, which, I'm not gonna lie, probably would have been a pretty good move for them. Di Pietro puffed out his injury until March, but eventually needed hip surgery his second one of his career. Prior to this NHL All-Star game, Di Pietro was a solid and occasionally above average goalie, but after the injury, he made 64 starts in a five injury plagued season before the Islanders bought him out. Now from the other New York team, the Rangers, we have Alexis Sharapinov. In one of the saddest incidents in hockey history, New York Rangers prospect Alexis Sharapinov died during a KHL game in Russia on October 13th, 08, at only 19 years old. That's my age. Sharapinov went into cardiac arrest and the ambulance that was normally at the game had already left. The young star had to wait approximately 15 minutes before it returned and he could not be rushed to the local hospital otherwise. The lack of proper medical care at the game may have been a very high factor in his death, although the exact cause of his collapse and passing remains in dispute. Now from the Ottawa Senators, we have Eric Brandstrom. At the beginning of the 2023 season, Eric Bradstrom was stretchered off the ice during a game after an unexpected hit along the boards from the Islanders forward Cal Clutterback, who, let's just put it this way, is probably had more penalties, more time in the box than he even has spent on the ice, so why is he in the NHL? I don't get it. Anyways, Cal outweighs Bradstrom by over 40 pounds. Bradstrom had dumped the puck in and Clutterbuck was back checking hard but probably wasn't in Brandstrom's field of vision until the very last second. As the Islanders forwards caught up to him just after releasing the puck, Brandstrom had no idea that the hit was coming. With his upper body briefly pressed hard into the boards, his legs remained free, flying upward with forward momentum. Brandstrom fell hard with the back of his head hitting the ice first, causing him to lose consciousness. Brandstrom suffered a concussion on the play and at the time of making this video, he is still sidelined from this injury. Now, we go to the Anaheim Ducks. This is Paul Correa. Where, if you don't know this play, you have gotta watch more hockey. This is Paul Correa. While visibly seen as not a long-lasting injury, the moment was shrouded in uncertainty, making it one of the most memorable instances in NHL history. In the Game 6 of the 2003 Stanley Cup Final, New Jersey's Scott Stevens, another pivotal figure in the league, delivered a devastating hit to Anaheim's Paul Correa. The concussion on Correa was immediate and to this day, he still has problems from this concussion. But he lay motionless on the ice, and when he got back up, they sent him, they allowed him to go back out there, because he was out of his mind, unconscious practically, because he didn't remember any of this for the next couple of days. He went back out there, and after spending several tense minutes on the ice, Korea stunned everybody. 
by not only standing up but also returning to the bench that same period and in a miraculous turn of events, Korea later scored a crucial goal, defying the expectations of everyone in the stadium and really just changing the league forever. Like, when you witness something like that, you gotta think, what happens if he gets hit again? That could have been the end. Not just the end of his career, I'm talking like the end for Paul Korea. Now we're talking about another infamous Scott Stevens hit, if the one against Paul Korea was not enough. Now this incident took place during the seventh game and deciding game in the 2000 Eastern Conference Final between the Devils and the Flyers. Scott Stevens nailed Lindros who had his head down as he crossed the New Jersey blue line. That does not give you the right to absolutely pummel a guy and possibly end his career. Anyways. This was the second major concussion served by Lindros and it was essentially the end of his Flyers career and his time as an elite NHL player. Though he still played in the NHL, just not at that level. And now we also consider him a bust even though I'd, I'd like to say it wasn't really because he was a bad player and didn't live up to expectations, it was because of this injury. Scott Stevens and the Devils went on to win that game and advanced to the Stanley Cup Finals which they lost. And I think Scott Stevens should have faced way more punishment than this because these two incidents weren't the only ones. He's infamous for this kind of stuff. It's one of those things where slapping a fine on the guy ain't gonna do nothing because he ain't gonna learn. Now, San Jose Sharks, Joe Pavaleski. This game has got to be one of the biggest turning points in playoff history. Joe Pavaleski left game seven between the Sharks and the Golden Knights all bloodied up. Pavaleski was cross-checked by Cody Eakin after a face-off midway through the third period. He lost his balance and fed, he fell headfirst into the ice. Pavaleski was wobbly as he was hopped off the ice and into the dressing room. Eakin was given a 5-minute cross-checking major and a 10-minute game misconduct, and San Jose took full advantage. Trailing 3 to nothing at that time, the Sharks rallied around their fallen captain and scored 4 goals on the power play. And Vegas eventually tied the game in the dying miss and forced an overtime. I remember this and I was rooting for the Sharks and I was so mad at that time. However, the Sharks responded as Barclay Goodrow sent them into the second round with less than 5 minutes remaining. And after this injury, Pavaleski did not speak to the media for 12 days but then broke his silence weighing on the controversial call by saying was it a five minute major i don't think it was am i glad they called it that way heck yeah pavaleski needed eight stables to close that cut in the back of his head now we got seattle kraken's jared mccann in the 2022-23 playoffs the seattle kraken faced off against the colorado avalanche and in Game 4, we witnessed the worst injury in the Kraken's short-lived history thus far. Jared McCann was hurt on a short-handed attempt midway through the first period. The shot was saved by Avalanche goaltender Alexander Georgiev and appeared to go into the netting behind the goal. McCann continued to skate into the corner and was not ready for the hit by Maw. McCann was down on the ice for several minutes before being helped off to the bench and headed straight back to the locker room. Ma was originally given a 5 minute major penalty, but it was reduced to a 2 minute minor. Seattle then scored on the ensuing power play to take the 2-0 lead. Ma ended up being suspended for one game for this hit, and the Kraken went on to defeat the defending Stanley Cup champion. As for McCann, he returned to Game 4 of the next series against the Dallas Stars. Before moving on with this video, leave a like and subscribe to catch our latest content and help our channel. Now we're going to talk about St. Louis Blues, Scott Perinovich. Rather than focusing on one single incident for the St. Louis Blues, let's talk about Scott Perinovich. Doubted as being one of the defensive prospects for the St. Louis Blues, he had some of the worst injury luck since 2020. Perinovich had torn his labrum, badly fractured his wrist, and fractured his shoulder. All three of these injuries came within a six month recovery time. And the reason why this is such a big deal is that the St. Louis Blues have had high hopes for Perinovich. He was their first ever defenseman from the University of Minnesota Duluth to win College Hockey Rookie of the Year and Best Offensive Defenseman of the Year, averaging 0.91 points a game. On top of that, he also won the Hobie Baker Award in 2020. Thankfully, Perinovich is finally healthy, so here's to hoping he stays healthy and gets back to that points per game record for the St. Louis Blues. Now we're going to talk about Tampa Bay Lightning, Steven Stamkos. 
2013, Tampa Bay Lightning forward Steven Stamkos left the ice on a stretcher during the second period after colliding against the goalpost. Stamkos was back-checking when he got tangled with words and defenseman Dougie Hamilton, and the result of this play was a broken right tibia. Stamkos tried to get up and skate twice, but he just fell and eventually just gave up and lay on the ice, covering his face and clutching Tampa Bay's athletic trainer. Due to this injury, Stamkos was forced to miss the Sochi Olympics and the 45 games he played with the Lightning, being out for a total of four months. Now, from the Montreal Canadiens, we have Max Pacioretty. On March 8th of 2011, Montreal's Max Pacioretty suffered a fractured vertebrae and severe concussion in a controversial hit by Bruins captain Zdeno Char. The gruesome incident took place when Pacioretty collided with the stanchion at the end of the bench. Chara received a 5-minute major for boarding and a game misconduct, but no suspension was handed out by the league. Pacioretty missed the remainder of the 2010-2011 season, but thankfully was able to resume his career at the start of the following season. Now from the Boston Bruins, we have Ted Green. In a preseason game that escalated into brutal confrontation, Wayne McKay of the St. Louis Blues engaged in a stick-swinging duel with Boston defenseman Ted Green. The confrontation took a dark turn when Green was struck in the head, leading to a fractured scroll and brain damage. The severity of this injury forced Green to miss the entirety of the 1969-70 season. Remember back then they didn't really give a shit about head injuries, it's just a piece of your body, you know. Upon his return to the ice the following season, he had to wear a helmet as a precaution, which is probably one of the first NHL helmets. Described as one of the most violent incidents in league's history, McKay's attack left a lasting impact on those who witnessed it. From the Washington Capitals, we have Chris Clark. In a game against the Boston Bruins in November 2006, Washington Capitals captain Chris Clark endured a horrifying injury when a puck struck him directly in the face. The impact rushed Chris Clark's palatal bone and he lost both of his front teeth. Displaying remarkable resilience in a true hockey player fashion, Chris Clark remarkably only missed two games due to injury before making a return to action, now wearing a protective face mask. Now we're going to talk about my team, Chris Tanev with the Calgary Flames. During a critical 5-on-3 penalty kill, Chris Tanev attempts to block a shot from the Canadiens captain Nick Suzuki. The shot, however, struck Tanev in the side of the head, causing him to fall on the ice and leaving the crowd in a stunned silence. Despite the Canadians possessing the puck, they called for the referees to come and stop the play rather than taking advantage of it, which is just short uh, sportsmanship, allowing Tanev to re receive medical assistance ASAP. After examination by the team medics, Tanev skated off the ice with the help of his teammates, and Calgary goalie Jacob Markstrom noted Tanev's toughness, emphasizing that he doesn't stay down too often. Tanev was then taken back to a local hospital where all the tests came back ne negative and he was cleared to, to come back and travel and play in Cal. For more NHL content, click the video on the screen to watch more. But before you go, leave a like and subscribe to our channel. Which of these NHL players shocked you the most? And do you think the league has done enough to address player safety over the years? Share your thoughts in the comments below.